the Holy Spirit would call our attention to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20 this morning. If you'll find that in your Bible, we'll begin by reading it as you're finding it. Um, it's the beginning of a new year. And at the beginning of a new year, I always like to read the Bible through in a year. We have something to help you with that. In the vestibule in the back, there is a reading plan. And it's my favorite. I call it Old Faithful because I've tried several. But I really like this one in that it puts the Bibles in chronology in the order they were written so that you can kind of follow the whole redemptive history. A lot of people don't realize that the Bible was, was grouped thematically. So you've got the, the law at the beginning and, and then you move into the historical books and then the prophets and then the gospels and the letters and so forth. There's some wisdom literature in there. But this puts it all in order for you. So you read through the Bible in a year, but you read through it in the order in which it was written, which for me was very helpful. I got saved reading through the Bible. And it was somewhere in the Old Testament where God uncovered my heart to me and showed me my sinfulness and I cried out to Jesus. It was very easy to do once I saw my sinful condition. But the second time I read through the Bible, that second year, it all began to fall into place. I began to see the, the end from the beginning and God's hand in all of it. So if you can make a commitment to read through the Bible twice in two years, I'm telling you, you'll shoot off like a rocket ship. I believe in reading the Bible every year. And so take that and, and let it help you. Today, I've been looking forward to this. In fact, we put it off for a couple of weeks. Today, I get to talk about my king, Jesus Christ, who he is, who he is, what he does, what he did. And I look down on the third row and I see one of my mentors in the faith, Jim Gables, is back with us and his wife, Carolyn. They've uh, had some illness that they've been dealing with, but I get to tell about our king, my king and his, the king that we have exalted, and he spent over 50 years exalting and still exalts. So today is a day reserved for our preeminent king. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's just pray and thank the Lord for who he is. And Father, we come to you through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Here, you have declared Him as preeminent. We bow before His eminency this morning. We declare Him as Creator of the universe. We declare Him as Sustainer of all that there is. We declare Him as God in flesh. 
We declare him as the head and ruler and dictator of his blessed ones, the church. And we declare him as our reconciler between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. These things we declare and we pray that you take delight in them because we declare them in absolute unity this morning. And we declare these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So, my King, your King, our King, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul lays this out very deliberately. And I think there's value in helping us to see how and why he lays it out in that manner. The mention of son in verse 13, if you go back uh, one verse to verse 13, he speaks of the, the kingdom of his beloved son. At this point, Paul begins to transition to the very heart of the letter. Up until now, he's been giving introductory greetings and salutations and so forth. But now he gets to the meat of the matter, the, the very heart of the letter, which in fact is the very heart of Christianity, namely the person and work of Jesus Christ. This passage, in my opinion, is the most concentrated presentation of the doctrine of Christ in all of Holy Scripture. So important is the doctrine of Christ in every age, including ours, that this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to take verses 15 through 20 this morning as one preaching unit. And then in the next few weeks, I want to go back and take each of the subsections as their own sermon because we need to be firmly entrenched in the doctrine of Christ. There's so many versions of Christ out there now. There's so many uh, redefinitions of Christ. There's so many Christs out there that we need to come back to Scripture and say, who is Christ? Who is He? Well, who does Scripture say He is? Who does Christ say that He is? And so I'll be honest with you, the, the great struggle that I had in coming to this paragraph of Scripture was staying disciplined. In other words, there's so many different directions we could go with this. We could take the doctrine of Christ and run so many different ways. We could chase a thousand rabbits. And I prepared several sermons, wadded them up, threw them in the garbage can because I had gotten undisciplined. I had gotten on my soapbox and I didn't stay fixed on Paul's soapbox. So we're going to stay on Paul's soapbox. What you'll notice is that we will present these massive truth claims. And then we'll go back and, and show how Paul was addressing the Jews to whom he was writing and the Gentiles to whom he was writing in the first century. And all the rabbit chasing, I'm going to trust that the Holy Spirit will allow you to do that in your own minds. I think when the truth comes clear, then you'll be able to relate this very easily to the, the Catholic uh, Roman Catholic heresies, to the Mormon heresies, to the Jehovah Witness heresies, and to all the other anti-Christian religion heresies in our day and age. So let me speak very quickly to the, the purpose of this doctrine of Christ in Paul's letter. How did Paul use this and why? Remember, there were three major strands of false teaching circulating in this Colossian congregation or in the city surrounding it at the time that Paul wrote. We've talked about them before. You had ancient Gnosticism, you had Jewish legalists, and then you had inner light mystics or mysticism that were challenging who Christ was. The interesting thing about each of those is that all of them made room for Christ. He was incorporated and integrated into their theology. The problem with each of those is he did not stand preeminent. He was there, but he wasn't the central figure. He wasn't the, the, the essence. He wasn't the substance. He wasn't the everything. And that was the problem with all of them. Structurally then, the apostle is explaining 
verses 13 and 14 in more detail in these verses, but he already has an eye in this paragraph toward those heresies which he will spell out in chapter 2. So you see what he's doing. He's saying Christ is the answer. Christ clearly defines truth. And and then I'll point out some heresies, and you'll see in light of Christ how heretical they really are. So he dismantles those heresies at the start. We need to know a little something about those heresies. Again, there were three strands, three different schools that were confronting this congregation. But it wasn't just three schools. There was some mixture. They just kind of all worked and weaved in and out of one another. So you had this hodgepodge of false teaching. But we can ferret out three strands that are uh, clearly identifiable. First was ancient Gnosticism. It was in its infancy stages at the time that Paul wrote, and it was a very complex system of religious beliefs. One of the things that makes this so difficult to wrap our arms around is it didn't have a founder per se. There wasn't a a book or a set of doctrines or writings that anyone put on paper that you can evaluate. It, it, It evolved over time. And what we discovered is over time, uh, there was this obsession with secret knowledge. These were intellectual people, smart guys, and and they had this hold on secret knowledge, and they were saying that in order to get to heaven, you must be uh, in in tune with this secret knowledge. One key tenant, tenant of that secret knowledge was this idea that all matter is evil. Everything that you can see and touch is evil. Therefore, they would say, God could not have created earth because earth is made up of matter. Well, if God didn't create it, who created it? And they said, well, there were these series of intermediaries between God and man, and so that God could remain unstained from any sin, He created these intermediaries, and one or the other of these intermediaries created the world, and maybe one or other of these intermediaries could have been Jesus Christ, and He was a created angel of some sort. And these are the types of things that were going on in ancient Gnosticism. Okay, along with that, you had uh, this idea of Jewish legalism. These Jewish people that kept bringing others back into the law, they were called Judaizers in those days, and they embraced Jesus as Messiah, true enough, but they kept adding works of the law as necessary prerequisites for salvation. They began with circumcision. You can believe in Jesus, but if you're not circumcised, Uh, then you're not getting to heaven because you don't really mean it. And then that led them into the dietary restrictions and the holidays, the Jewish holidays, and you need to observe all of these Jewish holidays. And one of their, their main points of emphasis was, if God didn't think these things were important, then why did He write them down in the Old Testament? Of course He did, which means we've got to go back and do them because God felt that they were that important. So believe in Jesus, yes, but you must do these other things as well. We'll see the fallacy of that in just a moment. But the third strand floating and and mixing in was this idea of the inner light mystics. They cropped up everywhere, and they weren't relegated to Jewish people or Gentile people. They were in both worldviews. You had these people who would come along, as they do in every age, claiming that God spoke to them directly through visions and dreams and other extra-biblical revelations. Paul speaks of this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 18, and he actually says that these visions are chalked up to their puffed-up minds. They originate from the brains of prideful people, is what he says. And everyone wants something more. Everyone wants direct revelation, direct connection. Everyone wants to lord their experience over others. And so you had this group of inner light mystics uh, that were coming in, even among the Gnostics and among the Jewish legalists. 
The easiest way to get someone to do what you want them to do is to tell them that God told you they needed to do what they're saying to do, you see. So you had all this going on, and the point of verses 15 through 20 is to knock the legs out from under each of these errors and any others really that might crop up. Paul has a one-all, catch-all doctrine of Christ here that will knock out any heresy that could ever rise up or crop up in all the history of time. That one-all, catch-all doctrine of Christ is this. Jesus Christ is all-sovereign, all-satisfying, and all-sufficient, period. End of story, end of debate. And so in anticipation of all these heresies, Paul presents Jesus as sovereign in three broad categories, which I'd like to talk about this morning. He is king over the old order, which is the universe, both seen and unseen. He is the king over the new order, which is his new society, the church, the kingdom of grace, as we call it. And he is the king over all order, both physical, spiritual, or otherwise. Jesus Christ stands preeminent, Paul says. And so let's, let's explore our preeminent king. First, he is preeminent over the old order, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Paul makes three massive theological truth claims concerning Jesus Christ here. One, Jesus Christ is Yahweh in flesh. Two, Jesus Christ is creator God. And three, Jesus Christ is the sustainer of the seen and unseen universe. First, he is Yahweh in flesh. Paul uses the word the image of God. That word in Greek is icon from which we get the word icon. And so you can put two and two together and realize that Jesus Christ is the exact imprint or the exact representation of Yahweh in flesh form. The specific claim is clear. Jesus is God in fleshly form. That, that sentence cannot be read otherwise. He is the, the image of the invisible God. This particular truth claim challenged the traditional worldview. You remember I told you, I, I, I want you to see how this came into the first century context, and then it will go out of that first century context all the way into the 21st century. But it cannot mean what it never meant, right? And what it meant when it first came to Jewish ears, Jewish people historically were looking for God's anointed one. They called him the Messiah. But most Jews would never have envisioned this anointed one to be Yahweh himself, that God would come and make himself into a man. They, that, that didn't enter into the purview of many Jews at all. I would say King David would be an exception based on some of the Psalms that we read. He clearly saw that Yahweh was God in flesh, but very few people were able to see that. They had this veil of, of religion over their eyes, and they just weren't able to grasp it. And we can see why. I mean, Paul in the previous verse calls, calls uh, this one Yahweh's son. But then in this verse, he calls him Yahweh. And so the Jewish mind was monotheistic. They believed in one God and only one God. So how can you have uh, one God and a son and they're all the same? We, we can sympathize with our first century Jewish brothers, can't we? 
early in those days when they didn't have all of the, the answers to those questions. We'll look at that more in detail next week. But for the Greek believer in this congregation, so you had Jews and Greeks, they came from a different mindset entirely. They didn't believe in one God, they believed in multiple gods. Uh, in fact, it, it was called polytheistic, poly meaning many. They didn't even know how many gods there were, a hundred, a thousand, a million, no one knew. They just knew there was multiple. Zeus was the strongest god in the Greek system, but even he was not considered almighty. Each god held superhuman powers. They had these, uh, these immaculate powers, but each of them were also subject to an overriding force called fate. Fate could step in at any moment and override any god at any time. Here, you, hear, you see what Paul's saying. There is not many gods, there is one God, and His name is Jesus Christ. He came to earth, He was seen of man, He was touched, He was heard, He, he taught, and He is the God of the universe. As well, He'll spell out, He overrides fate. He exercises authority over fate and providence and all of these things, so He is the end-all and the be-all. For the Greek mind, this would have been an altogether new way of thinking. It was a totally different ball game. And Paul did this by design. Yahweh in the flesh. But Jesus, secondly, he claimed, was creator of the universe. If you look there in uh, verse 15, it says, He is the firstborn of all creation. Now, this word firstborn has garnered great controversy throughout history among heretical groups, causing them to think that Jesus himself was actually a created being, that there was God, and then he created another God-like person called Jesus. This is what Jehovah Witnesses believe. That heresy uh, stretches farther than you might imagine. We were in a remote village in the Andes Mountains, 10,000 feet above sea level, and we encountered a person who claimed that Jesus was born of God in the sense that he was created, a created being by God. This is impossible. That's heresy. It's impossible because Paul has just stated that Jesus is eternal God in flesh. It's impossible also because Paul will state in verse 16 that he created all things. And if he created all things, how could he create himself? So it's a logical fallacy. This word must mean something different than first created. It must mean either first in rank. Uh, in other words, in preeminence, in value, in, in inheritance if you will, as it does in Psalm 89, verse 27. God calls King David the firstborn. King David was the lastborn son of Jesse, his father, not the firstborn. But God calls him the firstborn. He was the first in rank. Or the great Baptist John Gill uh, suggests it could mean he is the firstborn in the sense that he is the bringer forth of all that has been born. In other words, he, he is the, the one who births everything, creation, people, everything else. And so everything that has been born was born of him first. Either which way, I could go either way. I believe it's first in rank. But the Jewish people who would have received this, who would have first heard this letter written, they had traditionally believed Yahweh created all that we see. It would have been remarkable for them to think that when the third sentence in their Torah, in their scripture, read, and God said, let there be light, that it was Jesus Christ's voice speaking those words. And in fact, that's hard for some Christians to comprehend, isn't it? I'll talk more about that in just a moment. But Paul says so here. And other New Testament writers confirm it. John, in John's gospel, says the same thing, that Christ created everything that we see, and without Him, nothing was made that has been made, John says. 
The writer to the Hebrews says it. James Hill read it just a moment ago in Hebrews 1 verse 2. So this is commonplace in the Scripture that Jesus is the Creator. Jesus spoke the universe into existence. Now for the Greek believer, his mythology taught that there was nothing in the beginning except chaos. Chaos was a god, and chaos actually was considered a careless god who created another god, Nyx, N-Y-X. And then chaos and Nyx came together to create another god, Erebus. Then the gods began to procreate, and that's why no one knew exactly how many there were, because they just kept procreating and they keep procreating. So we can see how these Gnostic philosophers, these intellectuals, could prey upon that notion and create this series of emanations between God and man and say, well, Jesus is certainly one of those emanations, but He is not the creator of the universe. No. And Paul says, oh, yes, He is. Not only is He the creator of what you can see, He is the sustainer of what you cannot see. He goes on and he says that he's the the firstborn of all creation, and by creation he means the universe, uh, the cosmos, the earth, and all of its creatures, as well as heaven and all of its invisible creatures, angelic uh, creatures even. Verse 16 mentions, in him all things hold together. Actually, that's in verse 17 as I read it. All things hold together in Jesus Christ. So this, His providential powers hold together the constellations, the seasons, the gravitational forces of this earth, the things that we see. You do recognize that the science books tell us if we were any closer or further away from the moon, then life would be unsustainable. It would pull the, the waters to cover all of the landmass where we would have nowhere to live, or else we would be too far away from the sun and it would heap all the waters into one place, making life unsustainable. You do realize that the science books tell us if we were any closer or further from the sun that we would either be scorched to death or we would freeze to death. Well, who's holding all of this in place? I stand to tell you that Jesus Christ stands at the right hand of the Father holding all the constellations in place so that you can sustain life. That's your, that's your king. He's taking care of all of that. All you have to do is, drink up, is wake up and drink coffee. He's covered everything else for you. But he also holds together something that might be even more important, uh, the visible and invisible affairs in the spiritual realm. We talked about this in Ephesians in spiritual warfare, but you have this ongoing invisible warfare going on which shows up in real life. This is not Republicans versus Democrats. These are principalities of evil who are informing human minds in order to try to lead them away from what Christ desires and wills. But they can go no farther than He permits them, see, because He holds all things together. And it's not just politics, it's the media, it's all of these spiritual activities going on that show up in everyday life, and Jesus is in control of all of that. So the Jews would have heard this and say, okay, Paul is saying that in Him all things hold together, and again, they're thinking only Yahweh has these powers, these providential powers to manipulate world history. And, and, and Paul says, no, Jesus has those powers as God in flesh. He's still chipping away at their old way of thinking. Paul declares, Jesus is Yahweh and as creator holds Yahweh's providential powers over human history and world history and all history. He's moving it exactly where he wants it to its desired end. For the Greek believer, the, the prevailing opinion when he heard this was, was it, it was just earth, it was mind-boggling to them because their purview was 
that you had all of these pantheon of gods and, and it was almost like a free market concept. In other words, if, if we had a drought, it was because the god of drought had, had exercised some power over the god of rain. And that's why we had a drought or vice versa. If there was a great harvest, it was because the Greek god Demeter had wielded his power over the other gods and we were blessed with some great harvest. Or if there was war, it was because Zeus's son Eris had become angry and incited men to go at war against one another. These, these competing interests dictated the times and seasons. You see what I mean? It was almost like a free market system that whatever happened in life, it was because of some God thing uh, going on competing in the spiritual realm. Paul obliterates that notion by claiming that Jesus holds together everything in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. He is preeminent over the old order, the universe. Now, the other two go very quickly. He's preeminent over the old order, but he's also preeminent over the new order. And I'm going to fly by this uh, because we'll come back in two weeks or so to, to pick this up in more detail. But verse 18, the new order being the church, the new society, the kingdom of grace. Verse 18a says, and he is the head of the body, the church. We'll go into detail about what that word head means. There's some debate and disagreement, but everyone agrees that it means authority in some sense, right? Whether it's the head directing the the body or whether it's the head as a president directing an organization, it's, it's a position of authority. And he's in a position of authority over his body, the church. That's an extremely important word, and I want to deposit this seed into your mind so we can pick up on it and water it in a couple of weeks. The word church there is ekklesios. It's a word you've heard. We've talked about it before, ekklesios. It's made up of a root word and a prefix. The root word is kaleo, which means to call, and the prefix is ek, which means out of. And when you put it together, it's the called out ones. Called out of what? A few weeks ago, we learned back in, in verse 13, called out of the domain of darkness and translated into the kingdom of grace, the kingdom of his beloved son, as Paul says it. And so that the church, you, You are the called out ones. You were in the domain of darkness. You have been extricated, as Martin Lloyd-Jones says, and you have been planted in the kingdom of grace, this local congregation. Christ is our head. He is our headmaster, our principal. He is our CEO. He is our president. He is our benevolent dictator. What he says, we do. Where he says to go, we follow. Whatever his will is, we align ourselves to it. We don't go off and do what we want to do. He is our head. The Jewish believer had problems with this uh, because, again, these powers, the the headship, the, the dictatorship was reserved for Yahweh alone. That's why the legalism kept creeping back into their their uh, practice of, of Christianity. It kept pulling them back into these Old Testament rituals and regulations. Again, they would say, why would God have written them if He didn't want us to follow them? What's the point? Of course He wants us to follow them. And it would take them back into structuring their calendar and their, the circumcision and all the rest. They weren't able to see And even if they were able to see, they they still drifted back into it, that God did not write down those rituals and rules and regulations to be followed until the end of time. He wrote them down to reveal man's sin and restrain man's sin so that they would come to the point and say, I can never follow these rituals and these regulations to perfection. And it would drive them to their knees and point them to the only one who ever could and the only one who ever did. 
Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our head. He is the head of the church, the only one who has fulfilled all that the Old Testament required, not just externally, but even from the ground of His heart. Jesus Christ, our King, He's the only one, and that's why we love Him so. For the Greek mind, again, it was, uh, th- this would have come to them, and they would have had this uh, pantheon of gods uh, competing with one another, and, and the way it related to them on earth was it was every man for himself. The idea of a called-out community was foreign to them. It was, I need to please all the gods, and I don't even know how many there are. In fact, Paul went to one place where they had an idol erected, and it was erected to the unknown God, just in case we had missed one along the way. He said, well, how can, I, how can I please all of these? So they set up temples all over the place, and, and you go to this temple, and then that temple, and then this temple, and, and you go to all of these temples, but it was totally individualized. It wasn't a covenant community. It wasn't people coming together under one name, under one headship, under one king for the purpose of exalting his excellency. And they said, wow, th- this, this, is, this is entirely new. So he's preeminent over the old order, the universe. He's preeminent over the new order, the church, the new society. And then he's preeminent over all order. All order, everything. Verse 18b says, He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Here Paul makes two declarative statements. One, Jesus Christ stands preeminent over everything. And two, Jesus Christ reconciled the old creation and the new creation together in his work in his blood work on the cross. His bodily resurrection is seen as the final act in reconciling a world gone wicked ever since the Garden of Eden. Yes, Jesus Christ alone stands preeminent. For the Jewish believer, as he heard this or she heard this, hopefully the Holy Spirit was beginning to show him or her The Messiah was not a military general who would conquer all nations and bring about world dominion. No, Messiah was a spiritual general who subdues rebel hearts, leads men and women and children out of the old creation of slavery to sin and self and Satan and Satan's world system and leads them into a new kingdom, the kingdom of His beloved Son, the kingdom of of grace. And he will make that kingdom visible in future times. Whether you believe in a millennial kingdom or whether you believe in the eternal heaven, it's whichever you prefer. That which is unseen will be made seen in some tangible way. For the Greek believer, hopefully the Holy Spirit was beginning to show him or her, Jesus is not one of many gods. Jesus is the one and only God. Creator God. They weren't cast into an earth where free market power struggles among the divinities made fear and doubt and uncertainty reign in their hearts. No, Jesus was in complete control, building His kingdom, and once His kingdom is complete, the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever, as John puts it, in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. That day is coming. What glorious days those will be. But, but let me just close this down because my time's expired, but I hope you see he's, he's king over the old order, the universe. He's king over the new order, the, the church, and he's king over all order. He will bring everything together into a perfectly reconciled Garden of Eden-like state to rule and reign for eternity. Now, first century 
Jewish views and first century Greek views are one thing, but what about your prevailing views concerning Jesus Christ? Does Paul correct any misconceptions that you might have in these words? He did for me. I'll give you one example. I tend to categorize things in my mind. I think all of us to some extent do. We only know what we know, right? We only know what we were brought up understanding. And I was brought up thinking of God the Father as creating the world. Because every year I read the Bible through. And I get to the third sentence. I get to the first sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I guess I always thought that Jesus was in the background somewhere. That God the Father was doing the work and Jesus was cheering him on or, uh, you know, twiddling his thumbs. I don't know. I don't know what I thought. But if I'm reading Paul rightly here, in the beginning, Jesus Christ created the heavens and the earth. And Jesus Christ said, let there be light. And there was light. I had to correct that. It wasn't that I was a heretic. It was just I, I hadn't thought it through all the way. But if I'm reading Paul correctly, I, I think he corrects that little piece of, of my theology. Or, maybe for you, uh, you tend to think of Jesus as a baby in a manger. Powerless, crying, you know, wagging his arms like in the movies. Dependent upon Mary and Joseph. Maybe that's how you think of him. Or, or maybe you think of him as a harmless little lamb. Maybe you've read some scriptures along those lines. Or, or even if you're really theological, the Passover lamb. Maybe you think of him that way. Or maybe you think of him as an airbrushed picture hanging in your grandmother's home. The first thing in, in grandma's house is the airbrushed picture of Jesus with the flowing hair like the 80s and the side profile and all the makeup. And you've seen the picture. Is that how you think of him? All of those things are okay. There's nothing heretical about any of those things. But a full-orbed understanding of Jesus Christ is that He is all of those things and more. He is the indomitable lion of the tribe of Judah. He is God Almighty in flesh. He created all things that you see, and He created even things that you cannot see. He currently sits enthroned in yonder heaven at the right hand of God the Father, reconciling men, women, and children, changing their wills to align to His, leading them out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of His beloved Son or the, eight, the kingdom of grace. He, he is the God who Himself is is the image of Yahweh. He one day will return for His people. He will reconcile all things to their restored, redemptive order for all of eternity. This is a snapshot, just a mere snapshot of who Christ is. This is your Christ. This is your King. Yes, this is Christ your King. And I don't know what else to say but this. Go and serve your king. Let's pray.